Well, let me invite everyone. We're so uh, thankful for our Cookville campus. We're also excited to invite Baxter, Livingston, and Sparta. It's always good to be with all of you. No matter where you're tuning in from, thank you for coming and studying the Word of God with us. And as always, we want to give a special welcome to all of our family in the different correctional facilities. Can we welcome them to church? <laughs> Amen. Hey, let me say before we get into the Word, the Deer family is a Deer family. They go to our Livingston campus and so I just want all of our campuses, let them know, the Deers and Livingston, how much we appreciate them for what they did. God bless you guys. They are a precious family. They took a lot of their own retirement to buy that place because they felt like God spoke to them to do that. And we know God's blessing them in return. Amen? But uh, I just want to say thank you to all of you, not just all of our contractors, but all of you that gave in that offering. We're going to be able to provide a place for these pastors. It's not going to cost them a dime to come. And we've already got a bunch of them uh, heading our direction. But it's not going to cost them anything to come. Uh, all of their food will be supplied. We'll be there to minister to them so we can help them find refreshment and go back and pour into their churches. Don't that sound like Jesus to you? So thank you so much for making that possible. Let's pray. Father, we just ask you to open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. Now, God, we want to receive from you today. So we ask you to remove any barrier, any scales that would keep us from receiving from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to finish up a, ser a sermon we started last week entitled Indestructible, Untouchable Joy. Indestructible, Untouchable Joy. Listen, there is a God-given joy that nothing can destroy. But there's also... A negative on this, and it's Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. Notice this. A cheerful, that word cheerful means joyful, heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Today we would say someone who is living in and under a state of depression. They're a very weak person. Not, not, not a bad person, but when our spirit is broken, it says it saps our strength, but God wants to employ a joy that nothing can destroy. We're discussing four joy principles, and they are power, presence, praise, and purpose. Review just quickly. Number one, power. God's joy can provide a power that nothing or no one can devour. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet. How many obeyed that this week? <laughs> Amen. There's my godly people. Listen, the word of God tells you and I to eat the fat and drink the sweet. So yesterday, I got a big ribeye. I didn't cut that fat off. I ate it. <laughs> Why? Because I won't be in line with the word of God. He said, eat the fat. So when my doctor tells me about these two heart stents, I'm going to say, I'm obeying God. Shut up thy mouth. I'm eating the fat. Anyway, it's not really all about that. And send portions of those who have nothing is prepared for this day is holy to our Lord. Now notice what he says here. Do not sorrow. Now, he's not saying that we will never sorrow. He's not saying that. Every one of us have times in our lives where sorrow will visit us. Maybe the passing of a loved one. Maybe some tragedy happens to our family. Absolutely, sorrow will come into our lives. What he's saying here is, do not live in sorrow. Do not let sorrow uh, set up uh, a permanent residence in your life. Notice what he goes on to say. For the joy of the Lord. Everybody say, is is your strength. The big difference we need to understand here is this did not say the joy of the Lord brings us strength. This said the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's your strength for life. It's my strength for life. So we talked about this. We talked about enjoy, E-N-J-O-Y, one word, and we talked about in joy, I-N-J-O-Y, two words. And here's why we want to talk about that. Because the question we got to ask ourselves, and I wrote it down, is do you live, do I, do, do you live to enjoy life or do you live your life in joy? Why? Because there's a huge difference. Huge difference. And I'll be honest with you, talking about this old boy up here too, 
most of us spend most of our time trying to enjoy life instead of living our life in joy. What's the difference? Here's the difference. Enjoy, E-N-J-O-Y, is about external pleasure. But in joy is about an internal treasure. Nothing wrong with enjoying some things in life, but there's a big difference in that in living our lives in joy. John 15, 11. These things, it's Jesus talking. These things have I spoken to you. So I'm teaching you about my kingdom. Why? That my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. I'm teaching about my kingdom because I want my joy to be on the inside of you. And then John 14, we see the same verbiage. Verse 25, these things I've spoken to you. Jesus says, hey, I'm teaching you all these things about the kingdom. Why? Being present with you, but the helper of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Now notice what he says here. Peace I leave with you. Everybody say, my peace. So in John 15, he said, my joy. I want my joy in you. And here he says, I want my peace to be in you. And notice what he says next. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, troubled, neither let it be afraid. Here's what Jesus is saying. You need need to make a distinction between what the world has to offer and what I have to offer. He's saying my joy and my peace are different. Because see, the world offers you peace and joy based upon the external. Mine is focused on your internal. Okay? So his joy is not based on external conditions. It's based on an internal disposition. Jesus' joy is an internal joy that this external world cannot destroy. That's why John 16, 22, he says this, therefore you have sorrow. Now he's talking to his disciples. And he says, hey, guys, you're full of sorrow right now. And here's why. He understood it, because Jesus is, going, is about to go back to heaven. They don't want him to leave. He says, but understand, I'm coming back. That's what he says. But I will see you again. Now, in John 14, 15, 16, he's teaching about the Holy Spirit. And here's what he tells them. He says, when I come back, he's not talking about his second return. He's talking about something else. He said, when I come back, he said, the world won't be able to see me, but you will. And Philip goes, well, how can we see you? And then he was talking about the person of the Holy Spirit coming to live on the inside of them. And notice what he says is going to happen. He says, I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. There's going to be something on the inside, nothing on the outside can override. Now, Romans 14, 17, this is where we see it explained in the epistles. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is when the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of a believer and he sets up his kingdom on the, everybody say inside, on the inside of us. Notice this, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not physical. It's not external. Notice, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So get this. He says, what I'm wanting to do, on the, uh, do in your life is not external, it's internal. Notice this, Luke 17, 20. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, so they're saying, when's this kingdom coming? He answered and said to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. You know what he's saying? You can't see this kingdom with your eyes. Why? Because it's not external. Where is it? For the kingdom of God is Within you. Within you. The kingdom of God is internal, not external. The true peace and joy that Jesus offers is an inside job. Now, last week, I told you, we, I'm using that word, we all struggle with the same problem. And what's that? Most of us, even us Christians, are just like the world in this sense. We're chasing happiness. We chase happiness. What does that mean? We, we live our lives to enjoy life instead of living life in joy. And therefore, we chase happiness. Now, the problem with chasing happiness is the word itself. Happiness comes from a Latin word, hap, which means chance. So if we're basing our life on happiness, there's a good chance today you'll get it, but there's even a better chance you won't. 
Don't leave your life and my life, our joy and our peace up to chance. The word chance means the assumed, impersonal, purposeless determiner of un, 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 unaccountable happenings, comma, luck. So what's that? That means our happiness, if it's based on this external world, is up to luck. So if you're basing your happiness on luck, I saith unto theeth, good lucketh. But I wouldn't leave my life up to that. See, what's the differences here we're trying to make? You've got stress, which n none of us need to live in. You've got stress, and then you have the opposite of that, which is peace. Then you have sorrow, which the Bible says makes your life sick, and then you have joy. So what's the differences? Sorrow and sadness are what happens to me. But peace and joy hinges on what's happening in me. Now, here's what I need all of us to get. I have no control, and neither do you, over what happens to me. But I have every bit of control over what happens in me. How much of a God do I allow into my life? So, I said this to you last week. There is coming a day when our eternal God will change this external world. We can read about it in Revelation. You can read about it in Thessalonians. And what happens is, is God, okay, time is up. He, he judges Satan and all of Satan's followers, and he throws them into the lake of fire, and he sets up his kingdom. And this says when that happens, there'll, do, there'll be no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more sadness, no more tears. But here's the deal. So that's when our eternal God changes this external world. But the question I'm asking is, what are we going to do until then? Because that day is not today. So what God wants to do until then is our eternal God wants to change our internal through his eternal power. Which brings us to number two, presence. So number one, joy, the Lord's joy is our power. It is our strength. Number two, presence. It comes by way of presence. Acts 2, 28. 2, 28. You have made known to me the ways of life. So the psalmist is talking to God. Hey, you've shown me the secret to life, God. What is it? You will make me full of joy in your presence. If you want this joy, if we want this joy, nothing can destroy. It's only found in one place, in his presence. It's the only place it's found. Matter of fact, joy is not found in the absence of problems. Joy is only found in the presence of God. We know this. If you live your life in joy, even when you're going through hell, you'll do well. How do we know that? Paul and Silas. Let me read it to you. Acts 16, 22. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were severely beaten, and they were thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape, so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clapped, clamped their feet in stock. Stop here a minute. What were these guys doing? If, if we can, I know it's hard to do sometimes when we read characters in the Bible, but let's just for a moment try to slip our feet in their sandals. Okay? What were they doing? They were doing what I'm doing right now. That's all they were doing, guys. They were trying to keep people out of hell. They were, they were driving into Cookville. They were driving into Sparta. They were driving into Livingston. They were driving into Baxter. And what were they doing? Hey, we don't want y'all to face eternal judgment without God. So we want you to know that there's a God man that came down from heaven to earth. His name's Jesus. He died for your sins, and he wants to save you. And for that, they beat them severely. Not, I mean, beat them half to death, but that wasn't good enough. Then they drugged them to a prison and not only did they take them to prison, they, the Bible says they threw them in the inner dungeon. If I had time to describe that to you, it was a hole that was wet, and many people died in that hole, but that wasn't even good enough for them. Not only did they put them in the hole, they fastened their feet and their, and their ankles with chains. Now, let me ask you a question. 
your feet are in their sandals, how would you respond? And before you answer that, we get tore up from a Facebook post. Hello? Am I, am I pulling in your driveway yet? Because I, I know it's in my driveway. We lose it over crazy stuff. Now, look how they responded. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Sounds just like you, doesn't it? Here's what's important about the next line. And the other prisoners were listening. People are listening to you. See, we want people to listen to us when we want to talk to them about God. But we don't want them to listen to us when we talk to them about politics. Or, or, or how the boss is treating us. We want them to overlook our, yeah. You know what? They're not going to listen to us talk about God until we get our mouths right about everything else. The other prisoners were, them prisoners knew what they were going through. Instead of whining and crying and being mad, they're like, great and mighty is he. And they're listening to them. And what happens? Suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundations and all the doors immediately flew open and the chains of not just Paul and Silas, every prisoner fell off. When you get free, so does everybody around you. When I get free, so does everybody around me. Listen, please listen to this. Please listen to this. Now my question to me and to you, I'm not throwing stones at you, but when I read that, I'm thinking, would I respond that way? And if you're thinking the same thing, then here's my next question. Why wouldn't we? We have the same Holy Spirit. Or do we? Or do we? When you're squeezed, what's in you comes out. Is it we've got enough of the Holy Spirit to save us from hell but not live well on the earth? We need more of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you something. We need this kind of joy nothing can destroy. Are you listening to me? And that wasn't just for Paul and Silas. It, he's, he wants to bless all his children with this. So number two, or I'm sorry, number three is praise. So number one, the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's power. Number two, it's only found in his presence. Number three, praise is how we get it. Now, I used to preach that story wrong. I did. I think I mentioned it last week, but let me talk about it a little bit more. I used to preach to my college students and to this church. And I would say, are you in the middle of a bad situation? You can praise your way out of it. And I would point to Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas praised their way out of that jail. You know what? As I studied the scriptures more, I don't believe that anymore. I don't believe Paul and Silas praised their way out of that jail. I believe they praised their God into that jail and that jail couldn't hold him. You know why I know that? Because there's a scripture, I'm going to prove it to you, that says that very thing. See, we all go through times of incarceration. It may not be a physical prison. It may be uh, something bad happens to your family. It may be somebody's doing you wrong. It may be oppression and depression is trying to visit you. But every one of us have times of incarceration. But here's what I want you to understand. Anyone can praise God after liberation. The question is, can you praise God during incarceration? See, in Psalm 23, the reason I say they didn't praise their way out of that jail, but they praised God into that jail, is Psalm 23, the Bible says, the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. It brings him to us. Literally, that verse is saying is praise is exaltation. If you read the Psalms, let us exalt the Lord together. So here's what this verse is saying. Our exaltation sends God an invitation for a visitation. Our exaltation sends God an invitation for a visitation. Now, let me get down to where me and you live. A common phrase that we'll all use to excuse our behavior, I've done it too, is we'll lose it. We'll act very ugly and non-Christian, and we all do that from time to time. But a lot of people live there, and you know what we use as an excuse? Well, that's just human nature. You know what the Bible would say to you? Then get saved. No, seriously. 
Because the Bible says once we are born again, in 1 Peter, he says this, once you're born again, you've received a new nature. It's called the divine nature. Are you listening to me? That's why Galatians says there's a war in our life of the flesh and of the spirit. The flesh is our old human nature that won't go away, guys, until we're put in the ground or Jesus comes back. But then when we were born again, the Holy Spirit came and he brought inside of us a new nature and it's called the divine nature. Now, here's the deal. If you want more of the natural, the human nature, just practice more of the natural. So to the flesh, the Bible says, you'll reap of the flesh corruption. See, let me give you an example. It's human nature to complain, right? It's human nature to complain. Do you know God hates complaining? I don't think we really realize that in the church. Well, he hates drugs. Yeah, destroys people's lives. He hates uh, people drinking excessive amounts of alcohol. It runs their life. Yep. He hates uh, uh, adultery. Yep. Put on that list, he hates complaining. But we kind of like, well, that's just human nature. Stop. Bobby, it's not okay. Why do I know that? Because in 1 Corinthians, he writes a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians that says, hey, New Testament church, the things that Israel went through, through their deliverance was written down for us who inherited salvation in this New Testament. He's talking about their journey from the, the, the Egypt to the promised land. And he said, most of them did not make it to the promised land. Now listen to this. It says it was written down for our admonition. He said, most of them did not make it to the promised land and were destroyed in the wilderness because they complained. Not because they did drugs. Not because they do all these sins. Because they complained. See, here's the point. If you complain, you remain. If I complain, I remain. We'll never pout our way out of a bad situation. You go back to Paul and Silas. If that story went a different way, it'd be a different outcome. If Paul and Silas had been in that jail, and Paul would have looked over at Silas and said, Can you believe this? Who do you think you are? All I was doing is preaching the gospel. I ain't singing to you. They'd have rotted in that jail. Sounds like kind of sandals we'd wear. I'm trying to help you here. I'm trying to help me here. See, when we offer up, here's what God's trying to say to you and I. When we offer up exaltation in the midst of a bad situation, we send an invitation For God's visitation. Let me say that again. When we offer up exaltation in the midst of a bad situation, we're sending God an invitation for a visitation. Now, here's the question Which nature do you nurture? Which nature do I nurture? Because the one you practice, practice makes perfect. Do you practice complaining a lot? You'll perfect it. Do I practice complaining and anger a lot? I'll perfect it because I'm so into my flesh. But if you practice praise, you'll get better at it. Don't you Methodists shout me down because I'm preaching good. Here's the truth. We cannot operate in the natural and still cooperate with the supernatural. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Notice what he says here. Rejoice. What's that say? What's that about? Rejoice. You, mean, you know what rejoice means? To express joy. Rejoice always. This is, this, is, this is tapping into your divine nature because how many knows when it's a bad situation, you don't feel like rejoicing. But he says here, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Pastor Bob, what's the will of God? Am I supposed to marry this person? I will never step into that. That's between you and Jesus. Am I supposed to go take this job? Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. But what I got word on, I can be very bold. I can tell you exactly what the will of God for you is to rejoice always and in everything you'd give thanks. In everything I'd give thanks. Now, I always balance this out because we got crazies. Seriously, he didn't say for everything give thanks. He said in everything give thanks. 
So if you go in the parking lot today and you've got a flat tire, don't go up and go, oh, thank you for this flat tire. Oh, could you give me three more? You're a nutcase. <laughs> you know what you can do though? Is in that you can thank God for your spare tire. Hey, listen. In that you can thank God, men, that she's fixed to change the tire. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. See, Philippians 4.4, 4, Paul continues this thought. It's like he can't get enough of it. And I want, to, I want you to know something before I read this to you. He's writing this from a jail cell. Rejoice in the Lord always. And he says, you didn't get it the first time, so I'm going to say it again. Again, I will say rejoice. You know what that tells me, ladies and gentlemen? It's a choice to rejoice. It's a, cho it's a choice to complain. It's a choice to rejoice. We got to make the right choice. Um, Philippians chapter four, verse 10, Paul says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. He's writing this from a jail cell. That now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though those you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. He said, so there's a while that I wasn't taking care of my physical needs. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned. Learn. See, we've got to learn this because it's human nature to do all the other stuff. And so Paul, Paul, <clears throat> excuse me, had to learn this too. For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I got parentheses except California. Uh, anyway, <laughs> some people watch us from California. I'm just kidding, kind of. Uh, no, he's saying whatever, whatever situation I find myself in, I've learned to be content. I know how to be abased. That word abased means to do without. And I know how to, be, uh, how to abound. I know how to enjoy good things. Everywhere in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. And here's our famous scripture. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I love seeing that on the football field. I do. Yeah. On the basketball court. I love seeing them. But you know where Paul's wearing this jersey? In a Philippian jail. There's not 100,000 fans going, Woo! Can you wear that in a jail from hell? Number four, purpose. I think this one may be the most powerful. So hang with me. Hang with me on this one. Purpose. Purpose unleashes and increases a joy nothing can destroy. If you want to know what God's original plan was for man and woman on earth, if you want the original plan, Genesis 1 and 2. Start in chapter 3, me and you get involved and screw it all up. Seriously. Genesis 1 and 2, that was God's original plan. Now, thank God he had another plan after chapter 3, and he sent his son to die. He sent the Holy Spirit to empower us. Thank God for all that. But his original plan was Genesis 1 and 2. That's why I take issue when people say, well, if God's so good, why is all this? Because he handed it to us, and we screwed it up. You go back to Genesis 1 and 2, it was all good because it was all God. Genesis 1, he says, it created the lights, and he said it is good. He created the plants, he said it is good. He created the animals, he said it is good. He created man, he said it is good. Now, here's one we're going to have to deal with, fellas. <laughs> it says he created woman, and he said it is very good. <laughs> no, he did. You know what I think God did? He looked at Adam and said, I think I can do better. <laughs> and he did. Ladies, he did better. I get a lot of amens from the ladies on that one, but I'm just telling you what God said. He looked at Adam and went, mm. looked at Eve and went, <laughs> I upped my game. <laughs> Listen to me. But this is powerful. Don't leave me. Please don't leave me yet. God created man for purpose, not pleasure. God's not against us having pleasure. Again, I will tell you, he put them in a garden that was beautiful, naked. I don't have to go into detail on that. <laughs> Anything is at your disposal, he said. Right? But if you look at the original plan, he didn't create them for pleasure. He's okay with them having it. He created them for purpose. Because once he got done creating everything, he said, now here's the earth. Take responsibility. Subdue it. Have dominion over it. And you know what happened? They saw a tree, and it said it was pleasant to the eyes. They traded purpose for pleasure. 
and mankind's been doing that ever since. I believe one of the reasons that our society is so full of depression is because we've elevated pleasure over purpose. I'm talking about God's purpose. Living for pleasure brings sadness. Living for purpose brings gladness. The people in Scripture who had this indestructible, untouchable joy I'm talking about, every one of them were living in their God-given purpose. Paul and Silas had internal joy because they were living for an eternal purpose. Did you understand? Paul had a career. Paul was in full-time ministry before the Damascus Road meeting Jesus. He was a member of the Sanhedrin court. His, his office was in the synagogue. But after he, he accepted Christ and the Pharisees threw him out, he went into secular employment. Today, Paul would be considered a contractor. That was his profession. And we should all have a good job and a good career. But here's what I want you to understand. Paul's career was not his purpose. That's what he did for provision. What's the difference? Your career is what you're paid for. Your call and your purpose is what you're made for. Does that make sense, everybody? Be the greatest engineer you can be. Be a great doctor. Be a great nurse. Be a great teacher. But that's your occupation. That's your career, and that's what you're paid for. But that's not necessarily what you're made for, because what you're made for is found in Romans chapter 12, and it's giftings that he's given to the church. What's that mean? What are you doing for the kingdom of God in his church? And see, what I need you to understand is this purpose is where a lot of people don't have joy. Let me show you what Jesus said, Mark 6, verse 31. So don't worry about, uh, about these things. Now, he's going to tell you what these things are. What we will eat, what we will drink, what we will wear, what we drive, where we live. He's saying all that's external in this temporary world. What he's saying is don't get so, it's not that those things aren't important, but don't get so focused on those things. These dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. The unbelievers are so focused on and dominated by the materialism of this world. He's assuming you, you and I aren't. Notice this. But your heavenly father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously and he will give you everything you need. What's he saying? He's saying don't be so focused on earthly provision that you have no vision for your heavenly purpose. Because purpose is power. I'm going to skip Elijah here. People need to go. Anyway, I can just tell you this. Elijah has the greatest moment in his ministry in 1 Kings 18. It's where he has a showdown with the false prophets. And God answers by fire, wipes out all the prophets. I mean, it's, it's, it's movie time. And then chapter 19, Elijah leaves his purpose, runs away from the purpose God had for him. Matter of fact, enters into a deep depression, won't get out of bed, and the angel keeps coming trying to feed him to get him out of bed. And you know what God keeps asking him? What are you doing here, Elijah? What when Elijah left his purpose, he went from powerful to pitiful. And here's another one. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. This is King David. The, listen, the greatest king of Israel who ever lived besides Jesus was David. And notice this, it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle, David is the king, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Stop here a minute. Where's David supposed to be? Everybody say battle. He let them go. He stayed home. He's outside of his purpose. Notice this. Then it happened. One evening as David rose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful to behold. See, when we leave our purpose, our, our assignment from heaven, we make ourselves vulnerable. King David, listen to this, a man who had more joy than anybody else in the Bible wrote most of the Psalms. You can't read the Bible and not realize David is this, just this man that is so full of joy. One time he was so full of joy, he was twirling in the streets of Jerusalem, dancing before the presence of God. And his wife said, you look ridiculous today. And he said, hey, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm fired up about God. But what happened to David? He traded in his purpose for pleasure. And when he did that, he traded in joy for sorrow. And he lives in depression for a long time after that. Genesis 6, 22. 
Noah did everything as God had commanded him. Well, that's pretty cool. He did everything God told him to. He's building a boat. Chapter 7, verse 5, so Noah did everything God commanded him to. You go, Noah. Genesis 9, verse 18. Then the sons of Noah who came out of the boat with their father, so with Noah, were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham is the father of Canaan. And after the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. One day he drank some wine he had made, and he became drunk and lay naked inside of his tent. This is the man God used to save the world. Now he's drunk and naked in his tent. And if you go back and study that, that was a very shameful thing for Noah to happen. I'm not throwing rocks at Noah. Here's all I'm trying to say is when we stop living in our purpose, we start giving into pleasure. We weren't created. Listen, God wants us to have pleasure, but he wants us to, to elevate purpose over pleasure. To enjoy life, just pursue pleasure. To live life in joy, we must pursue purpose. And I'm going to end with this story. I've told this, I've been here 20 years this month. I've probably told this story less than five times. I don't ever want to be redundant, but this story so goes along with what I'm teaching you right now that I have to share it again. So let me share it real quick. I'm doing college ministry. There's a girl that comes to our college ministry. I love her. Jennifer loves her. All of our students love her. My leaders love her. But the problem is we couldn't love her enough. She lived in a deep, sorrowful depression. Now, I know medically there can be chemical imbalances sometimes. I get that. But I'm going to tell you, a lot of depression comes from what I'm about to tell you. But we could not get her out of that. We prayed over her. We, 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 we ministered to her. Leaders counseled her. We could never get her out of this depression. And what I'm about to share with you, you may think it's not love, but it's absolutely love because it was from God. I knew it. I'm leaving the campus one night. It's about 9.30 that night. Been going since 7 o'clock that morning. And I'm leaving the campus, and she's following me. And just, you know, again, telling me about her issues. And so I get to my car, and I open the back door. I put my briefcase in, and I shut it. As soon as I did, I felt like the Lord gave me a word for her. And I turned around, and I said, I'm confused. And she said, what do you mean? I said, I'm just confused. And she said, about what? I said, I'm confused why God likes me more than he likes you. That confuses me. And she said, what? I said, yeah, I just, it just looks like he likes me more than you. I have a great life and yours is horrible every day. And I said, think about this with me a minute. I said, we live on the same planet. Not only that, we live in the same country. Not only that, we live in the same state. And not only that, we live in the same city. Not only that, we go to the same church. And not only that, we go to the same college ministry. We hear the same messages. We sing the same songs. Everything's the same, but my life's great and yours sucks. What's up with that? And I said, I think the Lord shared with me what it is. I said, we're the same in nearly every area. Same city, same church, same worship ministry. I said, we're the same in every area, but one major area. And here's where our lives are different. I said, it is 9.30 at night. I left my house at 7 o'clock this morning. And I said, you know what? Since I left my house at 7 o'clock, I've been focused on everybody but me. I said, since you left your house this morning, you've been focused on nobody but you. You're making yourself sick. You will make you sick. I will make me sick. How? How? By living outside of the way we were created to live. God created us in his image. God don't self-focus on himself all the time. He so loved the world, he gave. We were created to not focus on ourselves all the time. Does that make sense? That's again why I'm saying, are you in your purpose? Are you in alignment with your assignment from heaven? If not, it makes you vulnerable to the enemy. I told this girl, I said, I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help you get off of you. See, here's how this works. This is crazy. Here's how this works, because we were created this way. If I'm super focused on me, you will never be able to focus on me enough. But if through God's help, I can get my focus off me, 
you hardly have to focus on me at all. Isn't that crazy? But what we think, we believe the lie. We, we got to focus on ourselves to really get where we need to get in life. No, it's totally the opposite. Is this, is this, is this pulling in your driveway yet? I'm serious. I'm, the Lord's trying to help us here. The Lord's trying to help. Everything in life comes down to focus. Jesus, our master, said it. What did he say? He said, the lamp of the body is the eye. If your eye is good, i.e., if your focus is good, your whole body be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body be full of darkness. And oh, how great is that darkness. You know what Jesus is saying? Focus is everything. So let me land it with this. I'm going to give you two assignments. One for this week and one for next week. This week, starting in the morning, I want you to get up. I want you to get your social media out. And I want you to focus on every negative thing you can. I mean, focus on Biden. <laughs> focus on Trump. Focus on the woke. I mean, just, I want you to absorb it all day long. Just absorb it. And then before you go to bed, hit, hit CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News and bring it all in. And then I want to talk to you by the end of the week. And then the next week, I want you to turn all that mess off. And I want you to study the Word of God and pray to your Father. And if you do watch something, watch something positive and see what happens to your life. See, listen, listen. This stuff ain't that hard. This isn't that hard. If you've been in church any time at all, I don't care what brand you went to. I don't care if it was the Church of God, the, 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 the Church of Christ, the Baptist, the Assembly of God, or Assembly of oh my God. I don't care what church it was. I guarantee you something you heard every week from your pastor, from your Sunday school teacher, from your small group leader, we all heard the same thing. Here's what it is. Bullet down to this. Every preacher, every Sunday school teacher says this. Read your Bible and Pray. Read your Bible and pray. You've heard it a whole lot. Read your Bible and pray. 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 Guess what we don't do? Read our Bible and pray. <laughs> now, come on. We don't read our Bible and pray, and then we go, what does my life suck? Are you listening to me? This is not that hard. He wants to do an internal work. But we keep going to external things. Read your Bible and pray. Read your Bible and pray. Read your Bible and pray. How many times have we got to hear that? 50 years and still don't do it? That same thing works in the natural and the physical. You know why I have heart, heart stents in my heart right now? Because I heard my whole life, eat right and exercise. Two things, eat right and exercise. Eat right and exercise. Eat right and exercise. Guess what I didn't do? Eat right and exercise. <laughs> Come on. This ain't that hard. I'm going to tell you something, guys. I'm not mad. There's an anointing that came on me today. Started at 9 o'clock service. No, no, listen to me. No, listen to me. There's something God put on me today. I feel it more than I've ever felt it. I haven't felt this in a long time. And I believe it's because God's wanting me to speak something to you. This fallen, fleshly guy who has problems just like you. God's trying to say something through me today. And what he's wanting to say is, let me do something on the inside of you. I want to do something inside of you. Quit trying to change this external and let me do something in your internal. Come on, Bobby. Are you listening to me? This is what true Christians is all about. This is what Christianity 101 is. And somehow we believe this lie that if we confess it and he'll bless it and everything's going to go great. No. Yes, I want blessings too, but God wants to do something on the inside of you. And here's the thing. It's available. Are you? It's available. What do you got to do, pastor? Read your Bible and pray. Got to read your Bible and pray, man. Well, I want to go deep. Okay, here you go. Read your Bible and pray. It's amazing to me, me the people that want to go deep that don't read their Bible and pray. You want to go deep? Read your Bible and pray. 
That's how Paul and Silas did it. And it didn't matter what you did to them. You could pull out their toenails. You could beat them half to death, throw them in prison. And guess what they do? Great and mighty is he. Great and mighty. Why? Because they had something on the inside that nothing on the outside could override. God wants to do that in you. He wants to do that in me. But we cannot avoid him. So in the morning, I want you to hear that still small voice say, hey, just spend a few minutes with me. Listen, I know there's some brilliant minds that's going to be screaming your name in the morning. They want to talk to you about the election. They want to talk to you about what's going on in woke cities. I get all that. But can I tell you, most of them are dumb. Why why do I say that? Because they're human. And the Bible says our brilliance is the beginning of God's lack of wisdom. What's that trying to say? Why are you listening to Bubba? Bubba's dumb. God, I really believe you're trying to say something to us. I really believe that, Lord. I don't want this just to be an emotional time. I want this to be a devotional time. I believe, Lord, you are preparing your last day church. I believe you're wanting to strengthen our core. Yes, we want to do what we can to make the external better. Yeah, I mean, sure. But Lord, if I read my Bible right, the external is decaying. It's going to continue to go spiral downward. So Lord, help us to allow you to strengthen our core. To do an internal work through your eternal power that Lord, nothing in this world can destroy. Do that for us. Help us, Lord. And if you're here and you know that you're not where you need to be with Christ, he's where this peace and this joy comes from. It's not found in any other person. There's no other name under heaven. So if you're in this room and you say, I know that I'm not where I need to be with Christ and I want to be today, I'm I'm not asking you to do it toward me, wherever you're at, campus, jails. But if that's you, you say, God, I'm ready. Lift your hand toward heaven. Say, God, I'm ready. Amen, 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 amen. Now let's talk to him. Let's talk to Jesus. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for me. And I believe God raised you from the dead. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me with your blood. I confess you as my Lord, my Savior, my King, my joy, and my peace. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. We celebrate with you.